Hello, everyone, and thanks for joining. I'm Chris. I'm VP of Engineering for Mattermost, and I will be the first person to talk during the webinar today. Let me share my screen, and we'll dive right in. Move some windows around so I can see. Okay, so thanks everyone for joining. Um, I'm very excited to have everybody here today. The topic for today is doing incident management with Mattermost. And we have some new features that we did that we have released recently. And we have some more features that we have planned for the future that we're going to cover some of that with you. Um, the, the sort of the, the agenda for the plan for this webinar is that I'm going to kind of spend some time talking through incident management. What is it? Why do we care? And, and a little bit about how Mattermost can help with that. And then after that, I'm going to hand it over to Paul. And Paul's going to walk you through some of the things we've done and, and share some of the um, exciting features we have and, and try to um, bring that back to, to how it applies to you. Uh, at the end, we'll have a time for Q&A. So feel free to put your questions in the Zoom chat and we will answer them. We'll dive into those at the end. We'll answer as many as we can. And with that, we'll get going. So let me start a little bit with what is an incident? When you hear the term incident management or the term incident, it can mean different things to different people. It often does. It's, it's very specific to context. It depends on uh, what organization you work for, who your customers are, what their use cases are. But at its core, an incident management is really any event that presents a risk to the company or to its stakeholders. And, and usually when we say stakeholders in the context of incidents, we mean either the company or, or more likely customers of the company, so users of our product. Um, so examples of types of incidents could be, there, there are lots and lots of examples of different types, but a couple of common ones are things like security events, uh, system downtime, customer uh, system availability, inavailability, those kinds of things. So um, the next obvious question is, why do we even care about incident response? What is, what is the, the motivation for us to dive into this? And I know a lot of you probably already understand the, the answer to this because you live it every day, but I think it's worth taking a minute to think about the kinds of things that we're trying to uh, solve for when we, when we think about how do we put these features together and how can Mattermost really help uh, with, with managing incidents. So first and foremost, we have a customer focus. We care deeply about our customers, our users, our stakeholders, the, these are the folks who really, um, who really make what we do possible. And so we really, as we think about how do we manage incidents, we really want to put the focus back on the people that the incident is really all about, which is the stakeholders, the, the users. Um, the, the second reason that we probably care about incident response or incident management is that, you know, time is money to the extent that, that we have an outage or we have a problem and it goes on longer than it should or than it could, um, that cost us time and, and eventually cost money for, for stakeholders. It's not just about the company. It's, it's, it's not just about kind of the company that you work in. It's also about the people that you serve in it because, because often incidents cost them money too. And so, um, and the third thing that I'd like to consider here is just risk. So there's all kinds of risk. Uh, we talked about, you know, some of the risk. It's, there's obviously financial risk when you talk about incident response, but at the same time, there are other kinds of risks or risks like legal risks. You know, if this, if this incident isn't handled properly or, or takes too long to resolve, there could be legal consequences. Uh, the, obviously, again, coming back to customer focus, you could end up in a situation where a risk or, or sorry, an incident creates this risk of, of customer, loss of customer confidence. And um, related to that, there's this risk of damaged reputation, either with your customers or in the industry. And, you know, as we've probably all seen, um, incidents can create kind of worldwide reputational damage if, if they're big enough and they last long enough. So those are some of the reasons that, that we tend to care about incident response and incident management. So I think it makes sense at this point to kind of start off the discussion of details here with what are the, the necessary components of incident management? What do you need to actually do incident management in a way that provides the correct value and the correct uh, responsiveness for both the company and, and for the stakeholders, for the users of your, of your systems? So there are a few things you need. First of all, you need a, a, a defined process. You need to have a process that everyone understands 
that is uh, that's clear and that is directly applicable and actionable for your specific use cases for which you're managing incidents. The second thing you need is tooling. Um, on the tooling side, it's most of our systems are complex enough that it's nearly impossible to manage incidents manually these days. There are a lot of people that try to do it, and there's a lot of tooling that tries to help. But one of the problems we tend to have with tooling is that it tends to be quite scattered. You get different pieces of information that exist in different systems, and it's really hard to kind of have your tooling work for you versus tooling be, being just sort of a kind of dumb, a dumb place to go and get information. So we'll talk a little bit about that in, in some future slides. Um, the third thing you need, which a lot of people don't, don't think too deeply about until they're in the middle of an incident, is a communications plan. And communications plan on the surface might sound like it's something that is for purely for the stakeholders. How do we tell customers what's happening? How do we make sure that the world knows whether our systems are up or down and what the state of them is and where we are in our debugging process? But at the end of the day, communications are both external and internal. There will always be internal stakeholders to your companies or to your organizations that care about what's happening in this incident. Folks on the sales side are probably their phone is ringing. If, if we have it for running a SaaS service and our service is completely down, I suspect sales folks are getting calls from customers. Uh, there are people in support that are trying to, to answer tickets, uh, support tickets that have been filed. And so both internal and external comms are super important. And the fourth thing, which is one of the most important things is, is docs for, for one through three. So um, having everything written down ahead of time, being able to do training, being able to provide input, being able to do things like dry runs, all those things are a piece of how you have an effective incident management plan. Uh, Mattermost doesn't obviously solve all these problems. However, it goes a long way toward giving you a lot of the tooling that you need to, to provide um, easy to understand and consistent incident management in your organization. So let's talk a little bit about each of those four components I just covered. Um, some companies, you know, in talking to a lot of different companies that do incident management and, and, ha and having worked in a bunch of companies that did incident management and, and managed on call for services, what I know is that some companies have no process at all, depending on the company, depending on uh, previous experience and the people who work there and the experience that they bring with them. In some cases, incident management is, is very ad hoc. People uh, respond to pages and they get up and they dive and catch and they, they essentially do their best to solve the problem in that moment. And then once the, the incident is over, you don't typically have the kinds of follow-ups and actions and, and retrospectives that are necessary to really improve your process as you go forward. Um, the other kind of category of companies that I see are companies that have a process, but are struggling to adapt their tooling to match it. They, they I mentioned this a bit earlier, they have tooling for monitoring, tooling for alerting, tooling for automated comms. Uh, they may have automated meeting rooms and those kinds of things, but they just haven't quite figured out how to hook all these things together and get a true system that allows them to be able to do incident management from start to finish in a way that's repeatable and consistent. Uh, one of the places where Mattermost can help when it comes to process is that we have uh, in some of this, the stuff you're gonna see today, you'll see that we've built in kind of a basic process to follow, a checklist in some cases, some configurability, and it's a place for companies that fall into that first bucket, the companies that don't have, don't have an existing process, it's a place for them to start. It's a place for them to begin to learn and iterate and grow their process and mature it. Um, so one of the other key components of incident management is at some point, someone always needs to be coordinating the incident. So who's sitting in the driver's seat? Um, incident coordination is what most people think of when they think about incident management or incident response. And so at the end of the day, it always needs to be clear who, we're fill, who is filling these roles. Who's the incident coordinator? Who is leading the debugging? Who's responsible for handling the internal and external communications? Um, and who is responsible for taking notes, for capturing all this information that's happening in the moment and making sure that it gets written down that you're creating a detailed timeline so that after all this is over, you, you know how to go back and do your retrospective. You can look at ways to improve and, and write your RCAs. Um, but the, probably the biggest problem that I see when it comes to people that struggle with incident management is just visibility. When you're in the, the heat of the moment and you're, you're, you have an ongoing incident, it's, it's sometimes very hard, especially for people who did not start at the beginning of that incident. So let's say the incident ran for a few minutes and all of a sudden you go, oh, I, we need to pull this, this other person into this incident because they're the one that can really help us. And we think they can give us some information that will really help move this forward and get us where we need to go with this incident. You bring that person in and the very first person that very first thing that person is going to say is where are we what is the current state of things what what debugging have we done so far um, 
what's the current state of our monitoring and telemetry? I see these alerts going off, but what does that really mean? And being able to have all this information inside a system that helps provide that visibility is, is crucial. Um, yeah. So the, the last part of this that I'm gonna cover in terms of um, how we think about what an incident is and how you management is what happens after the incident is over. This is a common theme that I see from, from companies that don't have a lot of maturity in their incident management process. They sort of just haven't, haven't grown to that point yet is that once the incident is over, things kind of get lost, but this actually doesn't start at the end of the incident. The things that happen after the incident is over actually should start as soon as the incident starts. So you need to be, uh, you need to be tracking all this information of all the, the things you took, all the debugging steps, all the actions you took. What did you change in these systems and when did you change them? So that as things come along after the fact and you go back and you start to look at, okay, what caused this incident to begin with? What's the root cause? And how did we get to where we got to that caused the incident? How did we get ourselves out of it? Uh, you, if you don't track all this information as you go along, you get to the end and people just kind of go, eh, yeah, I know we did this thing, but I don't remember we may have done five different things and I don't remember which logs we tailed and I don't remember which stack traces we pulled. I do kind of remember them, but I don't remember what we did in what order and what it led us to this. So a key piece of this is tracking as you go. But then after it's over, after you've gathered all this information, you need the ability to, to take this information that you've gathered and use it in, a, in a, a functional way to be able to provide things like action items. So a typical thing that comes out at the end of an incident is we talk about okay, what are all the things we need to take as actions out of this? How do, we, how do we try to create a situation where we give ourselves a good chance not to end up in the same type of incident again? Was it a, was it a bug in software? Was it a monitoring problem? Did our monitoring miss something? Did the, did the alerting not, not fire when it should or, or was the alert not detailed enough to tell us the information we needed to know to take action before this problem became a full-blown incident? Um, who owns these follow-ups? So anytime you have actions, you should generally always have owners. And so, uh, you need to, to have all this, this detail that came out during this incident to be able to make these decisions and, and, and assign these responsibilities. And probably the thing that most, most stakeholders care most about is the RCA. Um, usually if you have a, a, a well-defined incident management process, eventually you're gonna end up doing RCAs for either for customers or for other stakeholders. And, and if you don't have all this information uh, captured and organized in a way that you can kind of pull it out of that incident management process, and, and build it into an RCA doc, it's almost impossible to write useful RCA doc. So this is where DevOps Command Center comes in. Um, there are a number of challenges and you know, this is, a, this is kind of a, a topic that is near and dear to my heart because what I can tell you after having worked for a bunch of companies that have done incident management, that have managed SaaS services, that have been responsible for all these things I just talked about, I can tell you that before I came to Mattermost, I actually built this tooling myself more than once. I actually, I built it a bunch of times at a bunch of different companies. And one of the things I learned along the way is there's no really kind of standard tool for this. There's no out of the box tool that kind of gives you the visibility and the information tracking and this automation to automatically pull people into, into channels or, or into to Zoom calls. And so what ends up happening in most companies is that you end up taking uh, the, the tooling that you have and stitching it together and cobbling it together in some way to create this kind of centralized command center that helps you understand uh, where you are in an incident, how to manage it, what your process is and what you do after the fact. DevOps command center is designed to, to sort of ease that pain to be a centralized place that you can uh, bring all this, all these things together with your tooling and, and, and help support your overall process. And there's a couple of things uh, that it provides. First of all, I said earlier, we, in, we intend this first iteration of DevOps Command Center to provide a very basic process. It's not gonna be as complex or as sophisticated as a lot of organizations need, but it's gonna be a place to start. And then we, we uh, are able to extend that by providing facilities by which you can do things like integrate additional tooling, whether that be third-party tooling like, like you know, PagerDuty or, or VictorOps or those kinds of tools, um, telemetry, alerting, logging systems, all these things can be integrated directly into DevOps Command Center so that you can kind of get all this information in one place. Um, one of the things that, that DevOps Command Center is intended to provide is much more of a consolidated view. So we have this idea of incident channels and this idea that as you're going through the incident, from the time the incident starts to the time the incident ends, it goes through a certain set of stages. All the information for all the work that's done and what the state of those stages are gets fed into a single incident channel so that 
um, you can keep track of all this stuff in one place and you don't need to run around to all these different, once you get all your integrations hooked up, you don't need to run around to all these different systems to try to figure out what the state of things are. You see all this relevant data in a single view. Uh, we also have this the features that allow you to drive process. Uh, you can configure DevOps Command Center to kind of meet your needs in terms of tooling to the extent that you have, um, you have custom tooling, which is often the case. It's not something that you bought or that you got from outside your company. It's something inside your, uh, someone inside your company wrote and maintains. Uh, DevOps Command Center and Mattermost provide this ability to, for you to integrate those things directly into your incident management process. So you can get the output from those things into your incident channels. You can get it in context and, and in a timeline that connects with all the other, the other pieces of information you have that's feeding into the system. Um, we talked a little bit about automation and, and um, integration. Uh, you know, this, this is another place where it, it helps uh, here is to be able to, to get everything in context. And then you can also integrate this against the communications that you do against your stakeholders. We typically have in incidents, SLAs for communications. Every, you know, given, depending on the severity of the incident, we may want to communicate to external uh, stakeholders every 15 minutes or every 30 minutes or every hour or once a day or whatever. All of this automation and integration works together to keep all these comms and all these details about what we did and when in a single place. And then, as I said earlier, one of the places where people kind of get lost often is what happens after the incident. The incident is over and we go, okay, it's over. We stabilize things, we close the incident. Now, what do we do? DevOps Command Center is intended to consolidate all of these details into a single location, give you some views to kind of help you understand at a high level what happened as this incident progressed forward? Who was pulled in? Who stepped out? What actions did you take? All of this information gets, as I said, condensed into a, a sort of a single place that you can view. But the interesting thing about it is you can also export all of this data out into an external file that you can use as a baseline for doing things like retrospectives. You can walk through your detailed timeline and you can talk about the key events that happened as your incident um, unfolded. You can take all this data and use it as inputs to your formal RCA if you have to issue one. If you have to write a formal RCA document that you're gonna to ship to customers or other external stakeholders or you even have an internal RCA process, all of this data is crucial and super valuable when you start to try to put together these, these action items from a retrospective or these details about, uh, about an RCA. So um, I think that's the end of the topics that I had to cover. Uh, up next, we're going to have Paul Rothrock, who's a, a, a really good customer engineer here at Mattermost, and he's going to walk us through a, a, a demo, a live demo of, uh, of the products that, that we've talked about here. I'm sure, before I hand it over to Paul, just a couple of things. Uh, one thing, I'm, again, I'm sure some of you had questions. I mentioned this at the beginning. To the extent you have questions, I have not been monitoring the chat yet, but while Paul's presenting, I'll have a look at the chat. And then we'll dive into your questions at the end. Get ready. Hopefully, we'll, we'll have lots of good questions and we'll, we'll do a Q&A. So I will stop sharing and hand over to Paul. Paul, take it away. OK, so I'm going to take you through sort of the features of our incident management plugin by going through some of the uh, you know, benefits of using the, the plugin. And so I've already got an incident started for this webinar, and I made sort of some notes in the webinar. Um, and so one of the advantages is that, you know, all the relevant information is in one location. So with every incident, um, all of the discussion about, you know, what, what's this stack trace or where is this line of code it is all in one channel. And so that anybody sort of involved in the incident has all the information they need without cluttering up things, you know, cluttering up channels for other people or, or you know, spamming a bunch of different channels. And another thing you can do is use announcements to uh, keep other people in the loop. So if you, uh, you can either have them as slash commands inside the steps or you can run an, you know, an announcement here. So incident announce out square. And so you can see it posts a message into the town square uh, about the incident. And the other thing is you can run, um, you can, it consolidates all the data from different sources. And so in the process of figuring out these bugs, there's you know, a million links to a bunch of different stack overflows or maybe some documentation or some GitHub repos. And so this pulls it uh, again all into one place so that you can have it, uh, you know, in, in the one channel. So, and then I'll move on to the next stage. And so, you know, the, the, the important thing about the incidents is getting all the context around them. Uh, and so every interaction has all of the context. Uh, and then you can also update the incident status and severity so people understand you know, what the, uh, you know, how things are going. 
And finally, you can bring in relevant people with, um, let's see, I invite her. And so you can bring in the, the relevant people into it, like Chris said, you can get all get the expert knowledge that you need when you need it. And then if you need to hand it over to a specific uh, commander or you, you know, say there's a ship change and this incident's going longer, you can hand it over to uh, the incident commander. And so uh, commander should be said to Hermes there. So you can hand it over to another person so that you have that chain of control so that there's one person who's responsible for the status of the incident, sort of the single point of contact for any stakeholders on it. Um, and you, it's again, clearly, put into the channel so that everybody knows what happened and when. Um, and it also provides sort of a predefined process for managing the incident. So you can, you know, you have these checklists that you can adapt and it allows you to do an iterative process to improve uh, how you handle incidents. And I'll show you uh, one thing is we have the ability to, uh, for both active and previous incidents, you can view uh, you know, when the uh, items were checked off, how many people were involved, and um, you can sort of see here, you know, there's a big gap here, what happened here. We can see, you know, there was discussion about who, who do we go to for this. And so in the future, once the incident's over in your retrospective, one of the action items could be, you know, make sure that person's involved in the incident earlier so we don't have a massive gap in uh, the, you know, in you know, a massive time gap. And I apologize for that. My cat just knocked over a water bottle. Um, so let's go back to the incident. And so another thing that our, our incident management plugin gives you a lot of power over is, uh, you know, it lets you integrate with the, these external systems. So we have an Ops Genie uh, plugin, so we can look into your Ops Genie so you can see who's on call uh, with, you know, with either running slash command. Uh, we have integration with Jira. Um, so if you need to make a ticket, you can make it directly from within the, the channel and it would, uh, you know, create the, you know, it would include all of the context, include a link back to the channel so that as you're reading through the ticket, you can, you know, you, know, you can go to the thread and see all of the conversation that was happening around it. Um, we also include telemetry and alerting. So if you have a, like a Grafana instance, you can publish the, uh, the server stats or, or something like that to the incident management channel or to another channel and trigger an incident from it. So say we have, you know, a post in town square that you know, the server is down. Uh, you can create an incident from that post right here. Um, we also have an incident response plugin API. So if you have an external system that you want to be able to manage these incidents in a programmatic way, you can use a REST API to interact with it. And then finally, we have the, the ever popular, you know, Jitsi and Zoom plugins uh, so that you can create a meeting and get everybody who's working on it into a call very quickly um, to, you know, you figure things out in real time. And finally, the, the, the advantage of our incident management plugin is the postmortem. So not only can you track and review the history of the event, you can export an entire timeline of the event for your postmortem to go, go through, see where you can find process improvements and then iterate on them. And I'll show you uh, how, we, how you can create a playbook and sort of some of the options there. So when you install the plugin, you get an option for a blank play, playbook. And we have one that's sort of kind of filled out with a, a, you know, sort of standard stages for different uh, you know, for, for most incidents. And so you can use this to either build off, to, to build your own incident playbook. Uh, so you have something to start with. Um, playbooks have uh, descriptions. So you can, you know, add a description to the playbook uh, to let people know what it's used for or the last time it was updated. Um, as you can see over here, you can set the incident channel to public, which means anybody in the team can see it or private. And then you can invite people who will be able to start incidents with this playbook. And so now only myself, Bender, and Herbie's will be able to start an incident with this playbook. And this is good for uh, like security incidents. If you have a defined team that you know needs to work on security incidents, you can give them access to a security incident playbook uh, without you know exposing it to the rest of the team. And you know, going down here, um, you can you know we divide it up into different stages. And so this one has three stages: so triage. Um, triage, investigation, resolution, uh, and then under each 
each stage you have a checklist item that you can add. Um, and then you can also include a description. And in here, you can include things like links to relevant documentation or suggestions, or, you know, a description of sort of what, in, you know, say you need to get server metrics, how do you do that? You can include a link uh, to say your Grafana panel to get a, a snapshot of that in there. And then you can also do slash commands and the slash commands are really great because you don't have to sort of figure out what it is. So if you want to start uh, create Jira ticket, you just do slash and it will auto complete. So, uh, so that should see there. And so then that would enable that slash command. And this works not only for slash commands that are powered by our Matamos plugins, but also slash commands that you create yourself. So if you have an existing integration uh, to say, you know, take a server out of uh, your, uh, your reverse proxy to, you know, when it goes down uh, and you look that into a slash command somehow, you can run that slash command with one click inside of the incident. And so that's how you create an incident management playbook. Um, yeah, and so that's about all of the, all, of I, all I had to show now, I'll just go to the next stage. And I think we'll open it up for questions. So Paul, we do have a question. I have a few actually, but um, mm -hmm. we'll start with uh, <clears throat> Dylan Mount asks, can you go from, if you're in a stage, can you go back to the previous stage? Yes, you can. So in this menu option down here, you can go to the previous stage and see, you know, when things were done. And presumably that means you can also uncheck. Yeah, you can uncheck out of yeah, previous you, stages. And, yeah. Yeah. If you need yeah. to go back, you can uncheck it, and that uh, you know something wasn't done. Yep. Now I th I think uh, also uh, an interesting thing here is that, and we use this ourselves. So I, I didn't make that clear in my presentation. I should have, but you know, inside. Uh, Mattermost, we actually have a, we, we have several things that we use in this, this incident management plugin, but for, but, um, but we use this ourselves. We use it almost every day and it helps us kind of keep our, our process um, aligned to what we want to do and, and helps the, a lot of the stuff you see here are things that we learned as we went through our own in, incident management progress process and things that we, that were important to us. But one of the other things, Paul, maybe, I don't know if you have the ability to show this, probably you can, but, um, we have often been in situations where we went to an incident, we came up with a resolution, we closed it, mm -hmm. and we went through the kind of retrospective in the RCA. And then at some point we realized, uh-oh, it wasn't actually fully fixed. And then we got this new report, which isn't a new thing. It's actually just a new report of the old thing that we didn't fully fix, right? So we have the ability also to close, completely close incidents and then come back to them later and reopen them should we need to with that same context and everything's in place. I don't know. Oh, I, I can do it from within the incident channel. So I can do uh, restart. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so now I have another question in the chat. David Matt says, can you have multiple incident playbooks, one for security, one for cloud services, et cetera? Yeah, so you can have multiple incident playbooks. Uh, you can have pretty much as many as you want to so click create a playbook. Yeah, let's do it from this and click save. And so you get a, you know, multiple playbooks for different things. You can, you can rename them. Yep, they can all have different steps, different customized stuff, different tooling integrations, different, the whole point is it's configurable so you can hook it into all this stuff and build the, build the process as you need it for the different kinds of, of incidents. More questions? Okay, so I have a couple of, of others that came in. Um, so there is, uh, there were some questions around how to make a playbook. Paul walked through that. We do have, also have a blog post around um, with some details around how to make playbooks. So if you if you want to come back to this later and you don't um, you don't remember exactly what, what time in the recording we talked about this, there's a there's a blog post to it which you can ask. Uh, Harrison or somebody put the link to that blog post here, but we'll uh, we'll get it out to everybody that that joined the webinar so that you can find it quickly. Because yeah, I expect we'll get a lot of questions and feedback around how do we put these playbooks together and how do we do the integration. So it'd be good for everyone to have a link to that that blog. Uh, other questions: What are some ways, some other ways businesses manage command centers? Um, how do some users on Mattermost use these workflows? Yeah, I talked about this a little bit uh, in my presentation, but 
we have a number of different kinds of incidents that we can do. So we have, we obviously, we, we do have a cloud service, so it could be things related to the cloud service. We also have a, um, we have a, an on-call rotation for high severity things that come out of our, our core Mattermost product line. And so um, we use we use that. So let's say we have a customer or user that says, hey, we have this major problem. This particular feature has a big bug in it. It's you know lock, locked up my process. LDAP sync won't complete or some, something along those lines. We have the ability to, to, to actually use it to handle those kinds of support tickets and incidents as well. Um, we use it for that. Um, Paul mentioned a couple more Knox security operation centers. All these folks have a need for, for these kinds of uh, uh, centralized views and, and well-defined process. Yeah, and there's, there's a lot of other processes that businesses do, things like um, you know onboarding a new uh, employee. There's a bunch of checklists that you need to do. Some things you need to assign to HR, some things you need to assign to employee. And so I could see this being used for those sorts of processes as well. Uh, Cause again, it gives you, you know, it's very well defined. You can integrate it with existing systems and it keeps everybody up to date about, you know, what needs to happen and when, and lets you look at the process afterwards to see where you can make improvements. Cool. Okay. So I have one more, I don't know if it's one or two more. I'm trying to read through this. How soon after an incident should a team debrief or do a postmortem? Um, you know, I think it depends. Uh, I think a good general rule is in my experience, you want to do the 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 postmortem or the retrospective soon enough after the incident ends that you everything's fresh on people's minds. You know, you don't want to let too much time go by between the time the incident ended and the time you do the retrospective. Because even though you gather all this information, the perspective that, that's in everyone's brains does matter and people will be able to add value, more value the sooner you do it after the, the incident. Obviously, if you have an incident that happens after hours or it happens over a weekend, um, it's hard to do an immediate sort of um, a retrospective or postmortem. I think a good rule of thumb might be two business days. So if you can get the retrospective done within two business days, because I think a lot of times five, five business days roughly are, is, is a normal kind of normal SLA for, for a public RCA if you have to issue one. So getting the re retrospective done and all that discussion happening within two business days after the, uh, the incident ends gives you enough time to get your retrospective and all the other comms and docs you need to get together after an incident. So uh, one more, uh, there's a question, is it better to capture feedback during the incident or should there be a cooling off period first? Um, I think it depends on what kind of feedback you're referring to. It, you know, if it's, if it's a question of, this is a part of our process and it's broken. So we had this built in as one of our steps and it just didn't work well. I actually think it's perfectly fine and, and advantageous to note that, right? I mean, the nice thing about having it in Mattermost and using this this incident management plugin is you can just put a note right there and it'll show up in your timeline. When you export your timeline, you'll see that note that so-and-so said at this point, we had this process defined, we tried to do it, it was broken and here are the reasons why. So it's nice to have that also not only have those notes, but have them in context. Now, what I would not try to do is re-engineer your process in the middle of an incident. I think, I think it's, sometimes you have to do that. Sometimes you have to kind of go, go off the beaten path if you run into something you didn't expect. And those things do happen in incidents, but as much as possible, it's better to try to, to, to not kind of adjust your process as you go along because the, the risk there is that you create um, confusion and you create kind of a moving target for people to know what it is they're supposed to do or what they should be doing at any, any given point in the incident. So you may end up in a place where you just don't have any other choice to do than to kind of talk through like issues and solutions during the incident because it may be something that's urgent, but to the extent you can, I would try to just document it during the incident and talk about it in the retrospective. And I did see another, uh, a couple of questions that came into the chat. So Wolfgang says, uh, what about certain levels and demand and control level equals admin? I'm not 100% sure I understand the question. And uh, are you asking about like level? Um, like how, do we give different people different controls about moving to different levels? Is that the question? A granular um, sort of our back. Okay, if you could ping in the chat again and confirm if that's just, if that was a question, you answer that. that that'll help. Um, first and second level. Yeah, Paul, do you want to take a stab at this one? Um, yeah. So right now, people who have access to the playbook are able to start an incident. So anybody on the server 
Um, and that's how we manage access to start the playbooks. Admins are able to, anyone who has access to the playbook can also edit the playbook. And you know, one of the things that's on the roadmap is you know, adding some more permissions to this so that we can have more granular control over you know, who can do what. Is that, I hope that answers the question. Let us know if we didn't answer your question, Wolfgang. We'll try again. Yeah. And I just saw one from Dylan uh, asking, is uh, is it still in closed alpha beta? And no, it's actually uh, released. This is version 1.1.1. And if you have an E20 license, you can go into the plugin marketplace and install it under the incident management plugin. So if you don't have an E20 license, you can uh, send us a request for a trial. So let's see. I saw one come in at just the last minute. So you showed you could create a Jira issue from an incident management system. Can you do the opposite? Can you create an incident man an incident from a Jira ticket or Jira issue? Is that, that the question? Yeah. So can you go can you go the other way around? Is there an API for creating incidents? Uh, yeah, so there's an API for creating incidents. And another thing that you can do is if you subscribe uh, Jira to a specific channel, if a ticket comes in, you can create an incident from uh, the menu here. I don't have the plugin installed on this server, but this is what a, a Jira post would do, would look like, and you could create it from the menu there. So you can either use the API or you can use the menu to create it from a notification in Mattermost. Okay. Um, if we don't have any more questions, again, thanks everyone for joining. Happy to uh, answer your questions later. Reach out to us and let us know, and hopefully everybody tries it out and, and enjoys it. Mm -hmm.